Doctor. The controller had explained it all to her when she had joined the Caribbean station five years before. How a buzzer would sound, and the contact be automatically broken if the wrong operator had come on the air. It was the basic protection against a Secret Service transmitter falling into enemy hands. And if an agent had been captured and was being forced to contact London under torture, he had only to add a few hair-breadth peculiarities to his usual fist, and they would tell the story of his capture as clearly as if he had announced it en clair. Now it had come. Now she was hearing the hollowness in the ether that meant London was coming in. Mary Trueblood glanced at her watch. Six-thirty. Panic. But now, at last, there were the footsteps in the hall. Thank God. In a second he would come in. She must protect him. Desperately she decided to take a chance and keep the circuit open. WWW calling WXN. WWW calling WXN. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? London was coming over strong, searching for the Jamaica station. The footsteps were at the door. Coolly, confidently, she tapped back. Hear you loud and clear. Hear you loud and clear. Hear you— Behind her there was an explosion. Something hit her on the ankle. She looked down. It was the lock of the door. Mary Trueblood swivelled sharply on her chair. A man stood in the doorway. It wasn't Strangways. It was a big negro with yellowish skin and slanting eyes. There was a gun in his hand. It ended in a thick black cylinder. Mary Trueblood opened her mouth to scream. The man smiled broadly. Slowly, lovingly, he lifted the gun— and shot her three times in and around the left breast. The girl slumped sideways off her chair. The earphones slipped off her golden hair onto the floor. For perhaps a second the tiny chirrup of London sounded out into the room. Then it stopped. The buzzer at the controller's desk in radio security had signalled that something was wrong on WXN. The killer walked out of the door. He came back carrying a box with a coloured label on it that said, Presto Fire, and a big sugar sack marked Tate and Lyle. He put the box down on the floor and went to the body and roughly forced the sack over the head and down to the ankles. The feet stuck out. He bent them and crammed them in. He dragged the bulky sack out into the hall and came back. In the corner of the room the safe stood open, as he had been told it would, and the cipher books had been taken out and laid on the desk, ready for work on the London signals. The man threw these and all the papers in the safe into the centre of the room. He tore down the curtains and added them to the pile. He topped it up with a couple of chairs. He opened the box of Presto firelighters and took out a handful and tucked them into the pile and lit them. Then he went out into the hall and lit similar bonfires in appropriate places. The tinder-dry furniture caught quickly and the flames began to lick up the panelling. The man went to the front door and opened it. Through the hibiscus hedge he could see the glint of the hearse— there was no noise except the zing of crickets and the soft tick-over of the car's engine. Up and down the road there was no other sign of life. The man went back into the smoke-filled hall and easily shouldered the sack and came out again, leaving the door open to make a draught. He walked swiftly down the path to the road. The back doors of the hearse were open. He handed in the sack and watched the two men force it into the coffin on top of Strangways's body. Then he climbed in and shut the doors and sat down and put on his top hat. As the first flames showed in the upper windows of the bungalow, the hearse moved quietly from the sidewalk and went on its way up towards the Mona Reservoir. There the weighted coffin would slip down into its fifty-fathom grave, and in just forty-five minutes the personnel and records of the Caribbean station of the Secret Service would have been utterly destroyed. CHAPTER Two, CHOICE OF WEAPONS Three weeks later, in London, March came in like a rattlesnake. From first light on March the first, hail and icy sleet, with a force-eight gale behind them, lashed at the city and went on lashing as the people streamed miserably to work, their legs whipped by the wet hems of their mackintoshes, and their faces blotching with the cold. It was a filthy day, and everybody said so, even M., who rarely admitted the existence of weather, even in its extreme forms— when the old black silver wraith rolls with a nondescript number plate stopped outside the tall building in Regent's Park, and he climbed stiffly out onto the pavement, Hale hit him in the face like a whiff of small shot. Instead of hurrying inside the building, he walked deliberately round the car to the window beside the chauffeur. "'Won't be needing the car again today, Smith. Take it away and go home. 
I'll use the tube this evening. No weather for driving a car. Worse than one of those P.Q. convoys. Ex-leading Stoker Smith grinned gratefully. My aye, sir, and thanks. He watched the elderly, erect figure walk round the bonnet of the rolls and across the pavement and into the building. Just like the old boy, he'd always see the men right first. Smith clicked the gear lever into first and moved off, peering forward through the streaming windscreen. They didn't come like that any more. M went up in the lift to the eighth floor and along the thick carpeted corridor to his office. He shut the door behind him, took off his overcoat and scarf, and hung them behind the door. He took out a large blue silk bandana handkerchief and brusquely wiped it over his face. It was odd, but he wouldn't have done this in front of the porters or the lift man. He went over to his desk and sat down and bent towards the intercom. He pressed a switch. "'I'm in, Miss Bunnypenny. The signals, please, and anything else you've got. Then get me Sir James Maloney.' He'll be doing his rounds at St. Mary's about now. Tell the Chief of Staff I'll see 007 in half an hour, and let me have the Strangways file. M waited for the metallic, yes, sir, and released the switch. He sat back and reached for his pipe and began filling it thoughtfully. He didn't look up when his secretary came in with a stack of papers, and he even ignored the half-dozen pink most immediates on top of the signal file. If they had been vital, he would have been called during the night. A yellow light winked on the intercom. M picked up the black telephone from the row of four. "'That you, Sir James? Have you got five minutes? Uh, six for you?' At the other end of the line, the famous neurologist chuckled. "'Want me to certify one of Her Majesty's ministers?' Oh, "'Not today,' M frowned irritably. The old Navy had respected governments. "'It's about that man of mine you've been handling. We won't bother about the name. This is an open line.' "'I gather you let him out yesterday. Is he fit for duty?' There was a pause on the other end. Now the voice was professional, judicious. "'Physically, he's as fit as a fiddle. Legs healed up. Shouldn't be any after-effects. Yes, he's all right.' There was another pause. "'Just one thing, Em. There's a lot of tension there, you know. You work these men of yours pretty hard. Can you give him something easy to start with?' From what you've told me, he's been having a tough time for some years now. M said gruffly, That's what he's paid for. It'll soon show if he's not up to the work. Won't be the first one that's cracked. From what you say, he sounds in perfectly good shape. It isn't as if he'd really been damaged like some of the patients I've sent you, men who've been properly put through the mangle. Of course, if you put it like that. But pain's an odd thing. We know very little about it. You can't measure it the difference in suffering between a woman having a baby and a man having a renal colic. And, thank God, the body seems to forget fairly quickly. But this man of yours has been in real pain, M. Don't think that just because nothing's been broken— Quite, quite. Bond had made a mistake, and he had suffered for it. In any case, M. didn't like being lectured, even by one of the most famous doctors in the world, on how he should handle his patients. There had been a note of criticism in Sir James Malona's voice. M said abruptly, "'Ever hear a man called Steinkrone, Dr. Peter Steinkrone?' "'No, who's he?' "'An American doctor. I've written a book my Washington people sent over for our library. This man talks about how much punishment the human body can put up with, and gives a list of the bits of the body an average man can do without. Matter of fact, I copied it out for future reference. Care to hear the list?' M. dug into his coat pocket and put some letters and scraps of paper on the desk in front of him. With his left hand he selected a piece of paper and unfolded it. He wasn't put out by the silence on the other end of the line. "'Hello, Sir James? Well, here they are. Gallbladder, spleen, tonsils, appendix. One of his two kidneys, one of his two lungs, two of his four or five quarts of blood, Two-fifths of his liver, most of his stomach, four of his twenty-three feet of intestines, and half of his brain. M. paused. When the silence continued at the other end, he said, "'Any comments, Sir James?' There was a reluctant grunt at the other end of the telephone. "'I wonder he didn't add an arm and a leg, or all of them. I don't see quite what you're trying to prove.' M. gave a curt laugh. "'I'm not trying to prove anything, Sir James.' It just struck me as an interesting list. All I'm trying to say is that my man seems to have got off pretty lightly compared with that sort of punishment. But, M relented, don't let's argue about it, he said in a milder voice. As a matter of fact, 
I did have it in mind to let him have a bit of a breather. Something's come up in Jamaica. M glanced at the streaming windows. It'll be more of a rest cure than anything. Two of my people, a man and a girl, have gone off together. Oh, that's what it looks like. Our friend can have a spell at being an inquiry agent. In the sunshine, too. How's that? Just the ticket. I wouldn't mind the job myself on a day like this. But Sir James Maloney was determined to get his message through. He persisted mildly. Don't think I want to interfere, M, but there are limits to a man's courage. I know you have to treat these men as if they were expendable, but presumably you don't want them to crack at the wrong moment. This one I've had here is tough. I'd say you'll get plenty more work out of him, but you know what Moran has to say about courage in that book of his? Don't recall. He says that courage is a capital sum reduced by expenditure. I agree with him. All I'm trying to say is that this particular man seems to have been spending pretty hard since before the war. I wouldn't say he's overdrawn, not yet, but there are limits. Just so. M decided that was quite enough of that. Nowadays, softness was everywhere. That's why I'm sending him abroad. Holiday in Jamaica. Don't worry, Sir James, I'll take care of him. By the way, did you ever discover what the stuff was that Russian woman put into him? Got the answer yesterday. Sir James Maloney also was glad the subject had been changed. The old man was as raw as the weather. Was there any chance that he had got his message across into what he described to himself as M's thick skull? Taken us three months! It was a bright chap at the School of Tropical Medicine who came up with it. The drug was fugu poison. The Japanese use it for committing suicide. It comes from the six organs of the Japanese globefish. Trust the Russians to use something no one's ever heard of. They might just as well have used curare. It has much the same effect, paralysis of the central nervous system. Fugu's scientific name is tetradotoxin. It's terrible stuff and very quick. One shot of it, like your man got, and in a matter of seconds, the motor and respiratory muscles are paralyzed. At first the chap sees double, and then he can't keep his eyes open. Next he can't swallow. His head falls, and he can't raise it. Dies of respiratory paralysis. Lucky he got away with it. Miracle. Thanks entirely to that Frenchman who was with him. Got your man on the floor and gave him artificial respiration as if he was drowning. Somehow kept his lungs going until the doctor came. Luckily the doctor had worked in South America, diagnosed Curare, and treated him accordingly. But it was a chance in a million. By the same token, what happened to the Russian woman? M said shortly. Oh, she died. Well, many thanks, Sir James, and don't worry about your patient. I'll see he has an easy time of it. Goodbye. M hung up. His face was cold and blank. He pulled over the signal fire and went quickly through it. On some of the signals he scribbled a comment. Occasionally he made a brief telephone call to one of the sections. When he had finished, he tossed the pile into his out-basket and reached for his pipe and the tobacco jar made out of the base of a fourteen.